Hey, Chris and Andrew. Welcome back, guys. What's going on? Uh, nothing. Andrew, I always feel so bad because we did like 61 episodes of just me and Chris. So I'm always so used to just saying, what's up, Chris? And then Chris and I banter for like a minute and then you come in. So stop me from doing that in the future. Uh, well, it doesn't bother me. It's a nice way to kind of get into it. Cool. Uh, what's going on? What's going on? I went to a an emo concert last night. Oh, nice. What? Uh, yeah. Was that one of those ones that goes around different towns and stuff? Because we did a emo night not too long ago um, up at fiance's cousins, and that was that was a lot of fun. But it, it wasn't really like a lot of emo music. It was just like stuff people liked, and a few of it was. Mm. <laughs> So this was uh, straight up Hawthorne Heights. I don't know if you ever listened to them. Uh, they had like really popular emo song like 2004. Uh, they were doing last year. They started a 15 year anniversary tour of that record. Uh, and one of my other favorite bands, Emery, also played with them. So I was like, yeah, why not? And so I felt like I was. Uh, 15 years ago. I feel like I was 15. Oh. Again. It was, it was spectacular. When you said 2004, I was like, Oh, that was like six years ago. That was not six years ago. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. No, it was a hot minute. It was a lot of fun. Like I literally, that was a really defining time in my life. And music was a very defining thing in my life. So like, well, plus when I watched those bands, like 15 years ago, I couldn't drink. And so like, Last night I was just sitting there like drinking, listening to music that like defined me and smiling. And it was like a very, I've been in a really bad state. It was a very good thing. So yeah, <laughs> that's, that's what's new in my life. Other than that, my wife is on a spree where she wants to redo the house as cheaply as possible. So if you hear hammering, it's because she's laying oh, nice. floor in our kitchen. Well, that's just, that's pretty good. For fun, so. I need to uh, do a few projects around the house, but uh, yeah, you know, it's hard to find the time sometimes. Uh, Andrew, what's new with you? I am doing a lot of things. I don't know. There's, I'm getting into a lot of areas at Code Fund that I never have had experience with, I guess, and because of that, I'm learning a ton. Uh, but it's just, uh, I'm, I haven't felt like this behind, I guess in a, in a while. What, uh, what kind of new things are you learning? Well, we had to get very, very intimate with our database stuff recently because, uh, we installed, when I say we, um, Eric is the other co-founder at code fund with Nate and, we're integrating with some product. I'm not really sure. I can't remember why we were doing this, but uh, we basically installed something called Hasura, Hasura, which is an instant real-time GraphQL engine. And there's something that Eric needs to use it for. Um, but when we did that, what it does is it basically creates another schema in your database, which is what Nate said was good practice, but because that happened, we all of a sudden our, uh, restores like our dumps and our restores from production just completely borked and went total foobar. And Nate and I went pretty, pretty deep into the internals of Postgres to kind of figure out, figure out why that was happening. And I've never really, I think I said this recently, I've never really had to do, much with the database because I've always just used active record and I've never really had to configure the database. So that was new. Uh, started writing, uh, we have, we use metabase for kind of our business intelligence reporting. And Shout out metabase. <laughs> metabase rule. I, it, it's pretty cool. Uh, I don't know SQL though, off the top of my head, like I can kind of figure it out, but that Nate is a wizard at it and but we have to do some pretty complex things to achieve some stuff we want to do so Nate and I went on a little tour with that 
And what was also something interesting with Metabase is that we have this, we've, we've come to this instance where we have a lot of, and in Metabase, they're called questions, but they're basically like, this is a query you execute uh, to get a certain piece of data back. And then you can put those on a dashboard or just uh, view it raw. And we got to the point where some, we have Metabase dashboards embedded in the app, because as you can imagine, it's a lot faster because Metabase is hitting our replica and that's not slowing down the actual app. And these are some pretty intense queries. So we've embedded some dashboards from Metabase into the app. And we got to the point where we didn't really know, you know, what's, what question is tied to what dashboard. And if we change like this question, like instead of accepting a date filter, we just take in a start and an end date. We had no idea what that was going to break for the other dashboards. And there's not like an easy way to figure that out. So Nate had this really clever idea of basically pointing Metabase at its own database. And then we figured out the schema and have figured out how to query Metabase against itself to figure out what questions are in what dashboards, which was pretty interesting. That sounds like the movie Inception with Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah. Wait, was he in that movie? Yeah. 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 Was he? Yeah, he definitely was. I love that movie. I, yeah. I know for sure. <laughs> I, okay, yeah. It was an amazing I movie. I questioned myself. No, he was definitely I in it. I love Leonardo DiCaprio. So, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, Metabase is this open source tool, and Andrew did a pretty good job of kind of describing it, but uh, you can build dashboards off of like raw SQL, or like you can ask questions and it like connects to your database and like gives you the fields so you can build like charts and all kinds of really really cool things uh we use it at podia and like in we also have it set up on a replica so we don't accidentally like write some destructive sql against it but it rules because anytime like i have a question i want to ask like i don't have to like heroku run rails console app you know, whatever. I actually am just like, oh, open this up, do some SQL, get some results. It rules. And I think it's open source. And they it have is. An enterprise edition. Yeah. Shout out Metabase. Yeah. And we also, we do it against a replica too. And like you said, the benefit is that you can easily ask a quick question using raw SQL and not have to go into your Rails console. And the downside is if you don't really know SQL that well, because you've been basically only interacting with Active Record your entire professional career, then <laughs> there's some problems. Well, it's a really good way, I guess, to learn SQL, though, because you get to ask questions against a database that you already know. So, I don't know. The other thing I did, or I've been getting into, is we want to add some API endpoints into the app. And I've never had to do that either, but I've read tons and tons of articles about it. But Nate is very, very opinionated about how to implement that. And he's not down for the whole API slash V1 controller path. So that's been a, an interesting exploration as well. That's cool. Chris, what's new with you? Oh, man. Uh, I've been adding multi-tenancy to jumpstart pro or experimenting with how that'll go it's uh an interesting one a little bit and that it'll kind of have to be i think it'll have to be optional um you know it's possible you could probably you know build the app so that it's multi-tenant but there's only one tenant um and that would probably work just fine but uh yeah, just exploring that and seeing how I want to do that because it needs to be generic enough for people to to customize it and you know build whatever they want out of it. Um, and for the most part, I think we're going to use the like Citus Data um, Active Record plugin for it, which is based off of Access Tenant, and it can actually use the Citus database um, stuff, which is kind of nice. Um, but those basically operate by setting a default scope, which is kind of uh, nifty because I mean, everybody loves to say don't ever use a default scope. But if you do do that, um, then you can all, always by default uh, you know, filter 
your stuff in um, the tenant, which is nice. And then they also have another thing that inside of that scope, if you don't have a tenant set, it will throw an exception and say, you know, hey, you need to switch to a tenant first, which is kind of nice. So if you're really trying to make sure all your queries are set up correctly, um, works well. So exploring that and seeing how it'll work for people. Um, uh, there was something like, I think six or eight people all at once last week messaged me on or on the forums on Go Rails and stuff asking about how to use Uppy with uh, active storage. So a file upload, drag and drop interface. Um, so I worked on that too and I have a screencast coming out Monday. A ton of people seem to be interested in that all of a sudden, which I don't, I don't know why all of a sudden that was so popular, but it is. So I got that working and it, it works pretty well. You just like set a plugin for Uppy and it will all of your uploads upload to a, the Rails direct upload path or whatever. And then you can upload files from Dropbox or Google Drive and all that into your active storage stuff. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, that's I think that's why it's popular for drag and drop, like jQuery file upload and um, drop zone. And I think you mentioned file pond or something. File pond. Yeah, yeah that's what you use it. At the big, uh, the big podia. Yeah, I haven't, uh, I haven't even heard of that one. But there's quite a few libraries for file uploading, like drag and drop interface stuff. Um, but Uppy was kind of the one that I think the Shrine author recommended first. That when I heard of it, and Translode it made it, so it's pretty good. And yeah, it, I mean, it's neat, and you can customize it pretty well, and it's not too hard to set up. Um, but there is like a Somebody built a plugin for it, like a JavaScript module. And uh, I forked that and updated a little bit of dependencies and instructions and things. Um, and fixed, I think I fixed a bug in it because there was like, if you cancel an upload or something, it, was, it would break. Um, so yeah, that was kind of cool. Um, only other thing I've really been doing is set up AWS Cloud9 for the first time ever. Uh, cause someone requested that and that's a kind of a strange environment to work in, but I guess it's useful if you need some remote environment to do development in. It's kind of cool, but it used, it used to not be, uh, I, I once bought a Chromebook cause I thought it was gonna be all hip and like program the Chromebook took it back the same weekend, but, uh, like I used cloud nine and it was pretty like seamless, but I tried to use it because I gave a little like mini workshop at uh, just like a meetup here the other day for like intro to Ruby on Rails. And it was like, if I'm not mistaken, like I had to fire up like an EC2 instance or something like that in order to get Cloud9 to run. And I was like, mm, no, nah, I'm good. <laughs> so uh, were you setting that up for a screencast yeah. or just somebody was? Yeah, I was on? doing it because someone was asking about it and then I was like, well, I might as well just record a screencast and have that too. So kind of, it's kind of nice to be able to turn your support requests into a repeatable thing to share with other people. So yeah, ended up being a couple hours doing that. What else is new? Uh, no Southeast Ruby this year. We, we kind of talked about that before the show, but I was thinking about, I don't know if I talked about this on the show. I was trying to bring it to Memphis this year and I am unconvinced that I could get the same number of people to come to Memphis but I am convinced the people that came to Memphis would have just the most fantastic time but I said you know what we'll just do it national again and so I called I was actually looking at the Ruby venue we were at the first year and was trying to like think of ways to make parking not suck and stuff like that. And I got a quote from him and I could talk to Ernie Miller, who was a co co-organizer yesterday, maybe the day before yesterday. Yeah. And he was like, we were on the phone and he goes, have you thought about skipping a year? And I was like, not really. And he was like, you just sound so burned out. And I was like, 
Yeah, I guess I do sound that way because I guess I am really burned out. Uh, so then I was like trying to like work around it and still put it on and finally realized Ernie was giving some pretty sage advice. And so I think we're, well, I don't think we are going to take this year off and come back next year. So I'm sad and a bit relieved. Yeah, that's good. I, I haven't helped, you know, organize a conference before, but I can imagine, especially you're organizing a conference in a different town for the past couple of years, you know, that's got to be an extra, you know, level of stress for it. But even just getting all of those details together is just a nightmare. I'm like doing wedding planning now. And yeah, it's the same thing. Just like going to meet with all these people and figure out, you know, who's going to do catering and what it'll cost and compare all of them. And oh my God, it is a lot of work. So, you know, I don't blame you. And we've had so much fun in the last few years that, you know, uh, we will be excited when it comes back. And uh, yeah. I'll, t- I'll tell you what I am tossing around. I don't know if I'll do it. And I probably shouldn't talk about it, but who cares? Does anyone listen to this anyway? Uh, I am thinking about putting on a one day online conference and trying to like the OG remote Ruby. So the OG remote Ruby, except with like actual speakers other than you one time and me the rest of the time. <laughs> yeah, um, that's cool though. Yeah. So like, I know, I know it's been done before and I don't know how it went. Um, but I just, I have some ideas for it. Like, Laravel uh, does Laracon online. It's like Laracon.net or something. Uh, now, granted, they get like Taylor, the creator of the framework, a bunch of people like that. But it's like 12 bucks early bird. And you get like digital swag. So like people sponsor and like give you like credits and stuff to their services. Like a picture of a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, and then you print it out and you just like staple it onto a white t shirt. Yeah, you have, to, um, you have to like print it out and then cut it out so you can like wear it in the live stream. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I'm tossing that idea around because that would be like that's still organizing a conference on your own, but it's it's less risk and it's less moving parts. Would they, um, it's, it's, it, would they have like a. Like a Slack channel or something that people would. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's cool too. Yeah. That viewing party. So Wisconsin, Netherlands, India, UK. That's cool. I like that. Just having like you know anybody local that wants to come hang out can do that and watch live. Yeah, it's a really cool. Now, like, don't be wrong. Like they, like bigger names in Laravel they'll put that on. So like. I'm not expecting that I, lowly Jason, could just like put together this huge thing where people put together viewing parties. But I do think that we could put together something that people who can't afford to go to conferences, like, you know, they can watch the videos online, but we could maybe give them like eight hours in a Slack channel with other people while talks are happening. I don't know. I think it's a really cool idea and I want to adopt that idea. Yeah, and you could get, you could get like speakers anywhere, you know? Yeah. If, if, uh, really it, we just need speakers who are willing to prepare a talk and sit at their desk. Uh, that is, I don't, I don't know how many people will be willing to do that, honestly, but, you know, I think it would be, I think it'd be cool and I want to try it. And that's what I was talking about with Ernie and it wouldn't be like Southeast Ruby online or anything like that, but yeah. So that's what I'm tossing around right now. I know that programmers like it in front of their computer. So you just need ones who will go the extra mile and record a talk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's. I'm, if I'm not mistaken, maybe that's not the case. I'm pretty sure the Laracon people like they do it live. Uh, I'm pretty sure. I did, I watched it a few years ago, and like Ian Landsman hosted it, 
and would like MC it from his computer. And then when it's time to go to a talk, he would like change the stream over to like Steve Shoger's computer. If I'm not mistaken, he may have had the talks recorded, but yeah, that's cool. It's interesting. Um, yeah. You can probably switch off the live stream somehow between people. I'm not real sure, but yeah, that seems pretty, you know, it's a great way to be able to do something. And if it's a day, you know, you don't have to worry about venues or catering or anything. You just have to do a live stream. So whatever logistics are for that, hopefully are easier than all the rest of it. And it shouldn't cost anything because you can just stream live on YouTube, Twitch, whatever. Yeah, it's affordable. Like I can, the costs are low, so I can offset like that. Those costs are also offset to the uh, attendees versus, you know, we we have to charge a pretty penny for Southeast Ruby and we're still pretty cheap for a conference. But yeah, I don't know. We'll see if if I'm going to do it. I need to start planning it, but I'm glad to know at least two people are interested. So Yeah, we'll have to let you know anybody that's interested should, well, not tweet at you, but email you or something. <laughs> you can you can tweet at Remote Ruby. I checked that one. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think that that any feedback we can get on that, you should share it in the Go Rail Slack too and see what people think. If uh, maybe someone in there wants to give a talk to, you know? Yeah. I, yeah. There we go. So. Well, if you decide to do it and want any help, I am down to pitch in however you may need. Cool. Very cool. Yeah, Sam. It, it's much easier to pitch in on something like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I feel like it's, you know – pretty low risk for sponsors too <laughs> like i don't know it seems like i don't think it's easy per se i think it's a i still think it's quite a bit of legwork and like organization but it's just a different type and yeah i wonder if you can use like pipe zoom or something through uh you know obs or something to stream so you can like have your private group of speakers and switch between their screens and stuff um Ooh, you know, something yeah. like that to maybe make that whole process easier. So that's maybe something like that. You can do that with Zoom. There's a way to basically, uh, I'm trying to think of like the, I'm trying to think of how to word this, but I've been on Zoom calls before where there was a group of people who were able to present and everyone else was basically, it was basically like a big conference call. So they do have some mechanism to do that where you have people who are allowed to talk and share their screen and everyone else is just in there as like a viewer. Very cool. Yeah. How do you check that out? That sounds, we use Zoom a lot at work. So I'll just look into it. But uh, I don't really have much other Ruby stuff. Um, I, I used a Postgres array type today. That was woohoo. Um, oh, I've been experimenting with doing some Stripe stuff, like multi plan stuff. Uh, so, you know, like a subscription with multiple subscription items. And that's a different mindset for me. So, that's fun. Yeah, I don't think I've done too much with that. I have been some people asking for, you know, stuff on additions to pay to support quantities and whatever else. And, um, right now just the base subscription stuff is there. Uh, and it very likely will go the same way Laravel cashier did where payments end up just dropping brain tree support cause it's too complicated. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Sweet God. Thank you for saying that. It's so nice to be able to use it for PayPal for basic things instead, you know? So I want to, want to kind of keep doing that, but maybe that's all we support in Braintree is basic subscriptions. Cause you just don't have a, well, I mean, most of theirs is just like, well, you can do it. Just calculate it yourself and let us know what we should charge just fine but most people don't actually want to build that uh, and i don't want to build that so <laughs> we shall see yeah 
Yeah, I. Uh, it's been it's been different because my mind has always been very like a subscription has a plan and that's it and that's the way the world works and uh, if you don't do it that way then you're wrong. <laughs> Uh, which is not actually, and we don't actually, want your but, money. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Send it back. Take it back. Uh, it's. I don't know. It's pretty cool. It's. I, I'm still wrapping my head around it uh, and having to like update some APIs around it. But it's. I don't know. It's. It's one of those things where like once you kind of get it with Stripe, you're like, okay, this is good. And after my experience with SCA. I was like, "This is this is a redeeming quality. I'll I'll take this." So, but that's about all the Ruby stuff I've got. I haven't done anything new or fancy or uh, exciting. Nothing that <laughs> is cool. I got two things. If you guys don't have any, if you're willing to listen to my my terrible stories. Let's go. Uh, So number one, uh, last night I wrote a quick gem called pruner to basically help you like quickly, easily delete branches on in a Git repo. And I was thinking about this while I was writing it because there's not really any great guides for writing gems and I'm never quite sure if I'm architecting it the best way. So my question to both of you and Chris, feel free to take this idea FYI for a screencast. But my question to both of you is in your, like if you're, for example, this gem's name is pruner. And if you've ever worked with a gem, the, file structure is lib and then it usually has a folder with the name of the gem and then it has a ruby file and the base of lib with the name of the gem and i've seen a lot of people do a lot of different things here but do you guys if you have experience with writing gems do you guys typically put like the start commands in that file or like i'm just not sure like the best way to kind of kick it off because i've definitely seen a lot of people do it different ways like either just having it kick off from like the exe or like you basically the exe just kicks off this uh the main file in your lib folder i just i don't know um if you look at the rails like bin rails file that might be a good example like because the gem you're building is like an executable right like yeah. you're running a command. You're not requiring a library necessarily. Um, so like Rails will just require your environment and your application and stuff. And then it just requires Rails slash commands. And that's it. And then it kicks off just that require starts running the Rails stuff. So you could probably look into Rails slash commands in the Git repo for that and see how it works. And then, you know, any other gem like annotate or whatever other gems you might find that have an executable like that might be a good example um, to look at. Cause yeah, in, in general, like you probably want maybe a file that you can organize the CLI into a class and have all the option parsing in there or whatever, and then have a run method. So maybe when you require the file by default, it'll just like run it and that's it. Um, you know, there's uh, there's also the like Ruby main um, thing where you can like see, I think it's main, uh, where you can basically see was this uh, Ruby file run by the interpreter or whatever. Or is it file? I can't remember. Um, but basically, that's like code that will run if the Ruby interpreter started on that file or something. So you can do various things like that where you can have it like a, if you require this file, it wouldn't run automatically. But then if you ran it Ruby and the file name, then it would actually, you know, launch the process. So that could be another option that would work well. Interesting. 
Real quick, while since you mentioned Rails, I just want to go ahead and mention that uh, there's a email newsletter called This Week in Rails, and I did the last one. So if you have never looked at This Week in Rails, you should check it out because now I'm going to be doing some of them and helping them edit. Hey, that's awesome. I know I read it, but I didn't realize it was yours. Yeah, yeah, it was me this time. Cool. That's awesome. That's cool. It explains the drop in quality for anyone out there listening. <laughs> Is it the Rails Weekly on Good Bits? Yes. All right. I'll link to that. That's cool. Yeah, it was fun. It was. I messaged someone on Twitter uh, who had edited the one before me, and just mentioned that I really liked. Uh, I really liked that they were doing it. And I thought it was cool, and I just wanted to tell them that you know a lot of people you know we work on open source and we do like these side projects and do things for the betterment of the community, and it's nice to kind of just reach out to someone and say, hey, like I appreciate what you're doing. Like I found this helpful, or I like this, and. I did that. I'm trying to get into a better habit of doing that a little bit more with people in the community and just, you know, dropping them a quick line or even creating like an issue that's just like, this isn't a bug or a a feature. I just wanted to say thank you for this library and your maintenance on it. So it's really good. I've been trying to do that. Yeah. I need to do more of that. Um, And I'd like to get back into contributing to rails itself more and that sort of thing. I have a lot of fun doing that and it's, It's the stuff that makes the community go around and what makes Ruby so good. People just giving back for fun and for free. Yeah. So I I thanked someone on Twitter for that and they were like, well, if you're interested in helping us, um, we, we, we have some space for like another editor and like, maybe you can help us write some of the, some of the issues. And I was like, sure. And the next thing I knew I had a, invite to base camp with you know the likes of dhh and aaron patterson and all the rails core team and so that was pretty pretty cool that's awesome that's really cool uh what you just said chris about like you know those are things that make ruby good uh for someone that's on twitter i sure have references to a lot of tweets uh nate berkepeck tweeted And I thought this was a a good tweet. Part of the reason I continue to invest in Ruby is that no one ever says I stopped using Ruby because it wasn't very productive slash expression, expressive slash fun. No one is switching to insert main language of the moment here because it's more of one of those things. I thought that was pretty interesting. Pretty good little. Yeah, it's like I've said something similar in the past, like, you know, in the future, computers will understand humans better. So if you are choosing a language because uh, it's faster, the computer can run it and better or faster, you know, it's like, it's a temporary thing. It's not going to be that way forever. So, you know, and the things like Ruby will continue to dominate uh, in the long term, and we'll just see it's the same reason why nobody, nobody really writes assembly unless they have to anymore. You know, we'll see more people writing these, high level languages and you're seeing a lot of people talk about no code stuff, but uh, no code is still a bit limiting because you're required to use whatever is implemented already for you. So those will probably continue to grow, but I think, you know, it, when it becomes as easy as saying what you want, then it's not going to be too hard to, to code and your languages will look very much like Ruby in the future. I've been surprised. I've gotten a couple of emails and like, I don't get like a ton of emails just like from my website, but I wrote an article last year called using Ruby in 2019. And I had several people ask me to like update it for 2020. And I was like, well, I still kind of feel the same way. And like in the emails, I'll respond and be like, I'm not going to rewrite the post, but here are the things like that I, I feel that are new or still feel from last year um i don't know it's just cool that people are still vibing off that so yeah you should uh you should do a new post that's like you know how i feel about ruby in 2020 and it's just like c 2019 (laughs) (laughs) uh yeah that are just like incredibly depressing and (laughs) negative i think it's just a copy paste of last year (laughs) (laughs) just find all 2019 (laughs) yeah 
<laughs> or just leave some old 2019s in there just to, <laughs> to emphasize your point. <laughs> uh, on that tweet, before we move on, the first comment, though, is like for, is from one of my friends, uh, Devin. And he actually is writing all Elixir now. And he was like, oh, I actually did stop writing Ruby and all of OO because I didn't find uh, fixing nil and mutability bugs fun. And I find functions and mutable data way more fun. And I was like, that's like, I don't know, that's fair too. It was, it had me really torn inside, but I still very much like Ruby right now. I just always keep talking about wanting to try something else, but alas, here we are. Yeah, and you can you can write your code in a similar style in Ruby too. So it's comes down to how you. I mean, I guess it's people probably find it helpful. You're forced into that approach in their language, but you know, you can always do that sort of thing similarly in in Ruby if you want. Yeah, one thing I'll say is, as a recent graduate, the fact that they basically made us start out learning Java. I think is the main reason a lot of people don't actually end up finishing their computer science degrees because if they had given me Ruby or some other language that wasn't as terrible as writing Java, I don't think like I hated writing Java and I was like, I can't do this as a career. I hate doing this and I would never do this. And I even briefly considered like, you know, maybe there's something else like I can do, or I briefly got really interested in doing virtual reality, but I'm glad I stuck with it because once I found Ruby, I was like, okay, this is it. This is, I like development because I like writing Ruby and I, I'm good at it, but like writing Java, it, it's just, ter- it, it sucks that like we have all these people who come into college or boot camp. Well, I guess boot camps teach you actually things that you're going to use on the job for the most part, but for graduates going or people going into college for computer science and then they sit down and they're like, okay, yeah, you're going to learn Java. It's just, it's hard and it's not rewarding. And I think that's leads to a lot of people who end up dropping out of that degree path. Yeah. I hear you on that. Like I was programming for fun before college and doing a lot of Python and that was a blast. I loved it. Um, but then you get into C and Java and dot net stuff and it's a whole different way of thinking and it's not near as fun for me as python or ruby is so that's if, if you like that kind of style that's great you know i don't think it's it fits everyone so it's probably the same thing as you know reading fiction and nonfiction and so on everybody's got different approaches they like better so i don't know i think i think it's just for me, I want to get my thoughts out of my head and into software as quickly as possible. And the way I can do that best is with a scripting language. I think that kind of hits the nail on the head. Uh, like for so long, I wanted for so long, I was a very like arrogant. I mean, I guess I'm still arrogant and working on that, but I was a very arrogant, like new programmer. And I didn't understand why everybody just didn't write Ruby, right? Like it was, the godsend to me it was like the one chosen language um and then as i got more mature like there's a lot of different tools that solve a lot of different problems and a lot of people like we talk about using ruby because we can like a lot of people just use other languages because they can and that's how like like you said like the easiest way for you to get thoughts out of your head is with a scripting language like Ruby. And like, for some people that's another language and I've learned to like respect that and empathize with that. And like that is a very peaceful freeing thing. Yeah. I hear you. There's a lot of, I mean, depending on what you're building to, you know, there's probably a lot of things that if they're they very strict requirements or something, then you can be a lot more strict and, a typed language or something. So you're less likely to make mistakes or whatever. Um, whereas like Ruby and Python are great because you can go change them very quickly. And that maybe lends itself to solving problems, you know, building websites and iterating fast that are more useful to us because we're not building, I don't know, financial software or something, whatever it is, you know, it just seems like uh, this fits our 
programming environment really well and I like doing it. Uh, I was just going to say, like, it's just also there's so many libraries in Ruby. Like, oh, it just makes it so hard to leave because it feels like it's all been done. On that note, I tried Sorbet the other day. We talked about it a little bit last week, uh, but I tried Sorbet and I typed my Ruby and I'm not doing that again. <laughs> That's funny. I had a similar feeling when I was playing with Crystal the other day. It's just a very different feeling to go write code with types again. It's so, especially macros, like it is, uh, requires a different mindset than what I've gotten used to doing Ruby over the years. Yeah, it was, it was interesting because I like TypeScript. I think I talked about this last week. So I went into it with a very open mind and we had also talked about it on the podcast, like either that day or the day after. So I was like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to try Sorbet just to see, see what's up. And it's not a tool. I think it's amazing that they were able to create it because of how dynamic Ruby is, but it's not something that I'm going to probably use until, well, I mean, I would definitely keep looking at it. I'm definitely going to keep watching it, but where it's at right now, it's not a tool that I plan to use. Fair enough. I also realized I left my mic on while I stood up to go on my dog on my room. Sorry about that. Um, anything else we want to chat through or we want to put a bow on it here? Oh yes. My other thing real quick, this is not going to take long. I need you guys to tell me how and why this is a bad idea and dissuade me from doing this terrible thing. So excited. Oh yeah. So I've been having issues recently at code fund because I'm very used to having a QA person come behind me and basically spot all the issues with my code or basically someone who is much more experienced with how the user is going to use the app and thus able to find bugs or maybe not necessarily bugs, but implementation details that should be added or should be removed that I have been that I wouldn't know because I'm not in the app using it. So I've been struggling a little bit with that at code fund recently. And my, we've definitely, we've talked as a team and we're like, all right, well, we need to make sure we're doing more or we need to make sure we're defining like the scope or the, the quote unquote story or the task more um, to help with this and making sure we do this and that and making sure we're testing. And I'm definitely learning more and more every time a bug comes up that I introduce, I definitely learn, okay, well in the future, now I know that the user is going to use this, the app like this, and I know to look for that in the future. So the organizational aspect of this problem, we are definitely dealing with in a healthy and constructive way. But my terrible idea is sometimes I have, sometimes I forget you know, when you deploy to staging or because every time we use Heroku, every time we push the master master it deploys to staging and then you can promote to production essentially. But I always forget how many things are on staging that aren't on production. And I end up forgetting to test something occasionally that I needed to, which ends up breaking. So my terrible idea is that Heroku has the ability to send deploy like a deploy hook when a deploy happens and they also tag the version of each like push to production so there's not a lot of stuff you can really do with the deploy hook like you can't set headers or anything so that kind of canceled out some of my simple ideas for doing this but basically what i want to do is when i promote to production it's sends a webhook to a GitHub action. And I can't do this directly. I'm going to have to basically create either an inter an intermediate app of some sort or like just tool that basically every time you push to production, it sends a webhook to this uh, intermediary tool that then correctly creates a uh, web request to GitHub that then kicks off an action that 
tags the release on GitHub and then generates the change log. So then with that, every time we deploy to production, it tags production on Git or it tags that commit on GitHub. And there's a change log, a running change log so that I know, okay, there, these are the unreleased things that have gotten added um, that haven't been pushed to production so that I'm less likely to maybe miss some things. And I know there's other things I could do, but I really want to do this thing. And I don't, it would be way easy. GitHub has this concept of a, a repository dispatch, I believe is what it's called. It's basically, you can send a web request to your repository. It has to have a certain header in it. And you can use that to then kick off an action to run some tasks. But because you can't really configure the Heroku um, deploy hook, I can't put in that header I need. So I'm going to have to like go an intermediary route to send it like that. But that's my terrible idea. And I know that thinking about what I just said, it sounds kind of rambly, but I am either looking for like advice basically on how to better user test the app or QA it almost, or maybe <laughs> whether my idea to create a basically intermediary app that receives webhooks and sends webhooks then to Heroku to kick off or to GitHub to then kick off an action to run a change log, to build a change log and then tag it with a release version is a terrible idea or not. Um, doesn't uh, Heroku have like a release like a pre-release script you can write um, that it will execute if it's like in your repo. I think there's something like that because I just saw somebody that did a one of those that will run Rails DB migrate on every deploy. Um, you could probably use that and then use curl or something to make a request to GitHub. Um, that might work. And... You know, that's the, it's an interesting problem because like if you aren't um, just the concept of like, you know, how do you QA an app that you're working on that you don't actually use? It's really hard because um, the people who are actually using the app are the ones that are going to be the ones finding things and, you know, you're not going to know or be aware of those things to worry about if you're not using the app. So that's one of the things that like, I don't know, maybe you have to have, figure out an excuse to use the product more somehow for a side project or something um, that actually makes you a user of your own your own app. Um, that could probably help just from, you know, forcing you to, to pay attention to things a little bit more nuanced than just being a developer, adding the feature that we were told to do. Um, I know I did that a lot in consulting stuff where it's like, well, we built what you said, but, you know, cause I'm not using it and I'm not really thinking about, uh, how it actually works. I just did what you asked for. Um, so that kind of thing would be the ideal. I know that, you know, on a related note, like GitHub, somebody at GitHub was talking about where they'll deploy to, I forget, 10% of their user base, um, or servers or something, and then they will monitor for the next hour or something the error rate. And if that was to go up, they can go and roll it back. And so they make sure that, you know, if you made a deploy recently, then you are responsible for monitoring that to make sure that you didn't introduce anything that breaks. Um, so that's maybe another, you know, kind of approach that you could do with easy rollbacks for that sort of thing. Um, you know, don't make the announcement about the new feature or anything. Just like silently roll it out, see what happens. And if it's good, you can, you know, move on. But you can have sort of a silent rollout just to monitor things for a little while. That might be helpful. And we do silent rollouts. And the problem is, though, is they're not bugs. They're not creating because we use Rollbar. We're not getting bugs. They're just implementation details basically that are wrong. And the problem is, and I know like this is definitely something I shouldn't be worried about. And Nate and Eric were definitely like, don't worry about this, but it's definitely uh, 
discouraging, especially when some of these bugs get surfaced with the implementation while Eric is showing the app to someone that we're trying to um, like join us to help fund open source. And it's just kind of, it's discouraging, but I'm trying to ignore that because, you know, Nate had a very, Nate was like, dude, this is just like software has bugs. We fix the bugs. You can always fix the bug and it's not the end of the world. It's not like we lost $10,000 in like an hour because of your bug. It's like, you know, this user had kind of a crappy experience and we had to fix it and that's okay. And that's expected, but it's definitely, it's becoming more, it, it's happened a few times very recently, more than it has in the past, just because I'm now doing some more intimate features that are modifying, you know, the way some users use the app. And it's just kind of frustrating to hear like, Oh, I was on a call with this important company that we're trying to get to help us um, or help be an advertiser. And this massive bug that you introduced popped up and then I couldn't show them how to do this thing because of that. Yeah. I wonder if you like, can you sit silently on those calls and just watch sometimes and kind of see how people are using it more just that way. It sounds to me like something that just gets better with experience. Like the more you understand how everyone's using the product over time is just going to help you write better stuff and predict what you need to do. Cause it's not like they can tell you about these little tiny nuances when they delegate something to you as someone fairly new on the team. Those are things like my first job out of college, like got hired to work on genomics pipeline software. And like, I didn't have, I had one biology class in high school and none in college. And so, you know, being on this team of basically people who are programmers who also really knew um, biology well, I realized I'm, I'm going to have to spend the next like two years learning biology to be able to contribute as much as these guys um, can, you know, cause I just simply don't know it. So those are probably things that just, take some time as you learn the product and, you know, the whole experience that you're trying to build. Um, Cause you know, it's not really going to be something that can be easily transferred from one person to another. I feel like, so yeah, I don't know. It's a, that's an interesting problem for sure. Yeah. And with time, of course, like this will get better and I'll figure out the way people are using it and we'll get better as a team at, you know, defining, like, okay, it should work like this and we'll get better at defining like the scope of these um, quote unquote stories. We don't call them stories, but, you know, basically these tasks that we're implementing. But I uh, I want it now. <laughs> I want it right now. I want the silver bullet and I know there isn't one, but I would love it if there were. Yeah. And I wonder too, if you could use screencasts internally a bit more to communicate you know, those, those stories. And, you know, if someone's writing one, like, yeah, write it, but also like record a video and walk me through it. And then maybe you'll pick up on a little bit more of those nuances. Um, I worked with a guy a while ago that did, uh, he, he had people he outsourced work to, and he would just record videos and send it to them. And he like was 10 times more productive than someone else that I knew that was like, you know, writing their stuff to the contractors and he was just able to communicate way more in the videos and you could see literally what he was pointing at with his mouse and, you know, explaining it. And it just felt way better than a screenshot mock-up or words, you know, on a, on a document somewhere. So maybe those little things could help too. Who knows? There's a lot of complexity to that problem yeah that's actually a great idea and i'm just shout out to my team i have an amazing team and i'm really blessed every day to work with them because if i told eric or nate like hey i'm struggling and it would be really helpful if you record a video of like the feature you want me to implement like they would do it in a heartbeat and anything else i asked so just quick shout out i have a great team and i'm really lucky to work with the group of people i do jason do you have a silver bullet for me waiting in your holster uh no i just have a hashtag blessed 
<laughs> I'll take it. Cool. Well, fellas, good to catch up. Um, we will turn around and do this again next week. Yeah, sounds good. Sorry for the crackling. I'll see if I can get that fixed before our next one. <laughs> yeah, if not, it's all right. I kind of, I think I'll miss it if it goes away. So. Yeah, it's it's just part of me, and it's actually my voice crackles. Like that. <laughs> that's, that's really what it is. It's nice and reminiscent of a like a nice fire on an evening night. Yeah, what, wait until my voice turns into the dial-up sound, and then you guys will run. Well, yeah, I'll be looking for a new home then. All right, we'll see you. See ya. Bye. <laughs>